Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. Good morning, Father. The Word of God has so much to teach us today, so get, let's get into it. Turn with me to the second reading, which comes from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. We're going to go to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5, which says, Put to death, then, the parts of you that are earthly, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. Okay, let's stop there. So according to the Bible, greed is actually a form of idolatry. This happens when the material takes priority over the spiritual. Now greed is one of the capital sins. Raise your hand if you know what a capital sin is. Anybody here know what the capital sins are? Like five people. Okay. I think we got to learn, all right, about the capital sins. Are you ready to learn? Okay, so who can tell me, according to tradition, how many capital sins there are? It is seven. Very good, exactly. The capital sins are, repeat after me, pride, pride. greed, greed. Envy. envy, anger, anger. Lust. lust, gluttony, gluttony. and sloth. And sloth. Do we see any of these in San Pedro? We sure do. Man, they're all over the place in San Pedro. Okay. Now, St. Vincent Ferrer once wrote that the seven capital sins make us act like animals. Like animals. And he said, pride makes you act like a lion. Who can make a noise like a lion? Roar, or something like that. Greed, like a fox. I don't know what foxes, what, what they do, what sounds they make. Envy makes you act like a wolf. Who can make a sound like a wolf? Woo, something like that. Okay, okay. Anger makes you act like a snake. What would a snake sound like? Very, we got a lot of snakes here. Okay, good. Lust makes you act like a pig. Oink, oink, like that. Okay. Then gluttony makes you act like a dog. Can make a dog noise. Woof, woof, very good. Sloth makes you act like a donkey. Got any, anybody? Hee-haw, right? Something like that. He okay. Now, each one of the seven capital sins make us act like animals has an approaching virtue that makes us act like a child of God. Pride is an exaggerated love of one's own excellence. And the virtue opposed to that and makes you act like a child of God is humility. Greed is a disordered desire for material possessions. And the remedy for it is the virtue of generosity. Envy is the resentment of, another good, of another's good fortune. And the virtues that are remedies to this are fraternal love and gratitude. Anger. Is an emotion that itself is not necessarily wrong, but when it's not moderated by reason, it can become resentment and hate. And the virtue opposed to this that makes you act more like a child of God is docility and patience. Now lust is a, disor a disordered desire for sexual pleasure. And the virtue that brings order to it is, what do you think? Chastity, true love. Now gluttony is a disordered indulgence for food and drink. When you just can't stop eating the burritos and the fried jacks here in San Pedro, and the virtue that brings correction to this, that makes us act like children of God, is moderation. It also helps us to be healthy also. Now, the final one is sloth. It's laziness in physical or spiritual things. For example, not coming to church on Sunday... Is a, is a manifestation of sloth. We got a lot of sloth here in San Pedro. A lot of sloth. And the virtue that brings, that brings it to, to, to act more like a child of God is diligence. Diligence. And you know what? Every person sooner or later will experience the inner battle between the vices and these virtues. And it, it's a battle that takes place in your mind and in your heart. And if you're not equipped to fight this battle, you could literally lose 
your soul. That's why these seven sins are called capital, because they lead to bigger sins. You could say like they're like the tip of the iceberg. For example, let's look at one of them, envy. Some people confuse jealousy with envy, but they're different. Jealousy says something like this, ooh, I like what you have and I'd love to have something like that. Well, envy says, I want to take away what you have and if I can't do it, I'll destroy it. See, jealousy is based on attraction, but envy is based on hatred of another's good fortune. For example, imagine your neighbor buys a fancy new golf cart, $20,000, and you think to yourself, nah, they're just a bunch of show-offs. And you feel like taking a knife and puncturing all their tires. Then you are experiencing the vice that the capital sin named what? Envy. Or if someone at work is less talented than you and they get promoted instead of you and you do everything you can to make them look really bad and try to get them fired, then you are experiencing what? Envy. And from envy are born other sins like gossiping, cursing, backbiting, slander, hatred, adultery, and even murder. And we got all of this in San Pedro. I've seen all of these here in San Pedro. This is why envy is a capital sin because it leads us to a whole bunch of other, more, sometimes more serious sins. Okay, so let's apply everything we just learned to the gospel. So turn with me to the gospel according to Luke chapter 12, verse 13 forward. We're going to begin in verse 13 where Jesus said this, or excuse me, says this, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. I see this all the time, and it, and it saddens me. Families divided among themselves, brothers and sisters fighting with each other, sometimes even suing each other in a court of law over what? Their share of the inheritance. If your family is having these type of problems and divisions, then someone in that family is experiencing idolatry of greed. Or your parents did not leave their affairs in right order. Now our Lord Jesus had been talking about eternal matters, and this man distracted Jesus with sort of earthly matters. And in verse 15, Jesus responded to all the people there, take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, One's life does not consist of possessions. So let's stop there. What does Jesus mean by this? Now notice Jesus had said, for though one may be rich. So when the Bible talks about materialism or greed, it's not about how much money you actually have. It's talking about your attitude toward what you have, your possessions. For example, some people might say, well, that leaves me out, Father. Because I'm not a materialist, because I don't have any money, I'm broke. And I say, eh, be careful. You can be materially poor and still be greedy. You can be materially poor and sti still be a materialist. You know, you know, addicted to material possessions. Let me do a, a little five-part test to see how attached you are to your material possessions. Remember, this is not about how much you have, but about your attitude toward what you have. Test number one. If you are never satisfied or content with what you already have right now, and you always want to keep buying more stuff and more stuff and more stuff, then you're probably too attached to the material possessions you have currently. Test number two. When God and material possessions come into conflict, who wins? If the material possessions consistently win, that means you're too attached to them. Look back at your history. Do you find that when you had less, you actually had more time for God? And now that you have more, you have less time for God. Test number three. If you have excessive long-term debt, then you're probably too attached to having material possessions. Next month in August, we will be offering a workshop titled Faith and Finance to teach you how to get out of debt and to how to plan and how to budget and how to save money. I think we need to learn that here in San Pedro. Test number four, hoarding. A hoarder collects things just for collecting's sake. 
Hoarding is different legit, legitimate savings. If what you are saving for is tied to a legitimate purpose, then it's a legitimate savings. Otherwise, it's just hoarding. For example, if at home you have a closet full of clothes that you never wear, and they don't even fit anymore, you might be a hoarder. Or you have a closet or you have a garage with stuff that is just never used. You know, th then, then it's time maybe at that moment, it, maybe it's time to give away some of that clothes, you know. Maybe it's time to do a little garage sale or something like that. Test number five, last one. If you spend more time thinking and worrying about your possessions than about your spouse, or your family, or your ministry at church, then your attitude is not in right order. It's messed up. I remember a family member of mine, a, a cousin that I love dearly, he once said to me years ago, those who say money can't buy them happiness, they just don't know where to shop. And I said, no, no, he's wrong. You see, money can buy you amusement, can buy you entertainment, can buy you big famous expensive toys, even a trip to San Pedro, but it can't buy you happiness. Money can buy you sex, it can't buy you love. Money can buy you companions, but it can't buy you true friends. Money can buy you books, but it can't buy you brains. Money can buy you a big house, but it can't build you a home. Money can buy you flattery, but it can't buy you respect. This is why Jesus is saying to us, take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, One's life does not consist of possessions. And then Jesus taught them a parable of a rich fool. Verse 16. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. And then he decided, I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. But God said to him in verse 20, You fool, this night your life will be demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? So in, let's stop there. In this parable, Jesus uses really strong language. He said, you fool. Why did Jesus say that? What, was, a, was, was this rich man a fool because his land produced a bountiful harvest? Well, no. Is God against a good harvest? No, of course not. Then why did our Lord call him a fool? Was it because a man wanted to build a larger barn? No. God's not against progress. You know why? Verse 21. Thus will it be for all who store up treasure for themselves, but are not rich in what matters to God. The key words here are for themselves. The word of God is teaching us that when you think of money, don't only think of yourself. He was a fool in God's eyes because he had stored up treasure for himself and not rich in what matters to God. So when you save money or accumulate possessions, don't just think of yourself. Instead, think of eternal purposes. You see, if what you are saving for is tied to a legitimate purpose greater than yourself, then it's a legitimate savings. Notice that the man did not say, no, God has blessed me with an abundance. I have more than I need. Whom can I serve with what I have? He didn't say that. So the lesson is clear. God does not bless you just so that you can build bigger storage spaces for yourself. God blesses you so that you can also bless others. The harvest was not only for himself. It was meant by God to be used for others. His wealth was not the issue. The issue was that he hoarded it for himself with no thought of, of God. This man was physically rich, yes, but he was spiritually poor. He had everything except God, which means he had nothing. Which means he had nothing. The Jewish rabbis in the time of Jesus taught there's four types of people in the world. The first type of person is the one that says something like this. What's mine is mine and what is yours is yours. And they say that this was the average pagan person. Okay. Second type of person is the one who says something like this. What is mine is yours and what is yours is mine. 
like they just switched it. And they say, nah, they're just a fool. Now, the third type of person is the one who says, what is mine is mine, and what is yours is also mine. And they say, no, this is truly the wicked person. This is the greedy person and envious person. But finally, the fourth type of person is the one who says, what is mine is yours, and what is yours is yours. This is truly the holy person. This is the generous person. Think about it. What is mine is yours, and what is yours is yours. This, is a, this person is asking, how can I give more? How can I bless others with what I have? That's truly the generous person. And remember, the virtue opposed to greed is generosity. So the question is, which type of person are you? Which type of person are you? Are you rich in what matters to, to God? Now, I admit that if you're under the poverty line, then yes, material possessions can bring you temporary happiness. But your ultimate happiness doesn't come from material possessions. It comes from godly relationships. It's, it, it's your relationships that bring you happiness. It's, in the first place, your relationship with God. But secondly, your relationship with family and friends. That's what brings you to happiness. Because that pleases God. Now in today's first reading, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2, the great King Solomon wrote, Vanity of vanities, all things are vanity. In other words, he felt like everything was meaningless. Perhaps you know what that feels like a little bit. If, if, if any man should have, been, should have had a full and meaningful life, it was King Solomon. He was the richest man of his time. He had thousands of wives. He had a great education. And at the end of his life, Solomon said, it's all meaningless. It's vanity of vanities. In Hebrew, the word vanity just means like mist. It's just little mist that disappears. What about you? Is your life meaningless? Maybe your life is very full, but it's not fulfilling. Maybe you feel an emptiness inside, a hunger for something that is missing. Maybe you are being called by God to something greater, to a life that truly matters. That's why I left everything and became a priest. Do you want purpose for your life? Do you want meaning in place of emptiness? Do you want to make your life count because you only live once? Then put God first. The answer is that simple. Put God first. So do me a favor. Please tell the person next to you, put God first. Can you do that? Put God first. You know, when I was a teenager and someone asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my response was, I want to be a millionaire, man. God was not even on the radar there. And I wish somebody would have taught me back then when I was a teenager, this lesson today. It took me years to realize that my true wealth comes from God. And I started to put God first. Today, my treasure is Jesus. If the Lord becomes your treasure, your priority, then you also will be rich in what truly matters to God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.